and good evening to everyone. So up to now we have been talking about the use of uh, equivalent frame modeling for the seismic analysis of masonry buildings. What we want to do now is to see why this kind of modeling is actually representative of the actual behavior of a system which is not really a frame but is something more complicated. So we know that uh, our objective is the seismic analysis of buildings, of masonry buildings. They can be new buildings to be designed or existing buildings to be analyzed and assessed. Or in some cases also we want to assist the um, selection and design of retrofit measures. But in all of these cases, we need that our model be able to represent the response of the entire building. And we want to be able to assign to our structural elements constitutive relationships which include nonlinearity, as it's typical of materials which are approaching their failure, and also to represent the failure modes that can be uh, activated uh, in the building. So as uh, we have already seen, one of the main assumptions behind this type of modeling is that uh, out of play local mechanisms are prevented. And this is usually assumed to be true because of good effective connections between intersecting walls and between walls and uh, uh, floor diaphragms. As such, mechanisms like the ones represented at the bottom of this slide cannot be uh, represented and cannot be captured by the global analysis in the model, together with the response of uh, uh, the uh, in-plane well, in response of the elements. So basically, we end up with a global model that can represent the behavior of um, masonry walls in terms of deformation of their elements like piers and spandrels. Here I've represented the two extreme mechanisms that Professor Lagormarsino already presented. The first one, a soft story mechanism with weak piers. The second one, a uh, um, spandrel mechanism with weak spandrels and strong piers. So there are two extreme mechanisms. Usually we have a combination of them in the actual in-plane response of masonry walls. So first of all, a justification for the uh, selection of uh, our uh, frame geometry can come from observations, just geometric observations, on the um, layout of the walls. And if we do so, we can easily uh, find out where our piers and spandrels are. Piers are the, par the portions of masonry between, uh, um, between openings aligned horizontally, uh, spandrels are between openings aligned vertically, and nodes are the remaining portions. And this is easy to do if the geometry is quite regular. Here is another example. Again, we can easily find our elements like uh, piers, spandrels, and rigid node. But there is not only this geometrical justification behind the selection of this type of modeling. If we look, for example, at the damage due to earthquakes in real buildings, we can see that uh, it tends to concentrate into these elements, again, piers and spandrels. For example, in this case, from a 1997 earthquake in Italy in the central regions of Umbria and Marche, we can see that uh, mainly the piers were damaged in this building. If we take a more recent earthquake, the 2012 Emilia earthquake also in Italy, we can see other examples of uh, damage, uh, especially localized into piers on the left-hand side photo, or into spandrels on the right-hand side. But they can also appear, of course, as you are saying, in uh, more than one type of element. They can, we can have combined mechanism, like in this case, where both spandrels and piers got damaged. And this is an even more recent example from two years ago, basically, in uh, um, Amatrice, in central Italy. And here, actually, this, we could consider this building kind of an uh, educational example. That building was actually retrofitted in order to prevent um, local mechanisms, like out-of-plane overturning of walls. And in fact, it behaved like a big box altogether, emphasizing the global response. And in this case, we can see that all piers or spandrels were damaged, but the building did not collapse. It was uh, demolished afterwards because of the severity of the damage. But you can see that the building was still standing 
while most of the city was down. So in this case, because of the, um, of the effectiveness of uh, those uh, retrofits uh, that, uh, again, prevented out of plane overturning. But here we can see all the type of damage that with our um, equivalent frame models, we can capture quite, uh, uh, quite well. If we don't trust these observations, we could also carry out more refined analysis, for example, finite element analysis on uh, uh, plane walls. And again, we would see that in most cases, uh, the formation would concentrate within spandrels and uh, piers, while nodes, which are the connections between these elements, are usually less, uh, um, less uh, affected by strains and deformations in general. So, if we want to model a 3D building, we need to start from understanding and from modeling each of its plane walls, transforming them into plane frames. And the first operation to do is to actually identify piers, spindles, and nodes. Again, if the geometry is quite regular, like in this case, this operation is quite simple. In fact, if we look, for example, at uh, uh, the, the picture on the left-hand side, we can see that if we identify vertical strips of masonry between openings, we remove them, what's left are the spindles. On the right uh, image, instead, we do the opposite thing. We take horizontal strips between openings, we remove them, and only the piers are left. We need to be careful when we define the height of the piers. It usually is not just the geometric height, but in order to account for the actual behavior and crack distribution, usually the height must be adjusted depending on the, on the size and on the layout of the openings. But this operation is quite simple. So whatever is not a pier in a spandrel is a rigid node, and so here we can easily identify our frame. If the openings are not so regular, then this operation is not trivial. But there are algorithms, for example, also implemented in Tremuri, that allow to identify or to approximate at least the location of uh, our spandrels, of our piers, and of our nodes. And you can see that in this case, the geometry, the shape of the node is quite nasty. It's not just a simple rectangle, but again, is in order to kind of optimize the representation of the behavior of an actual structure. Once we know where our elements are, as Professor Lagomassino was saying, we can assign, um, assign the failure modes and, in general, find uh, the strength and the nonlinear behavior in terms of uh, uh, um, stiffness and uh, nonlinear deformation capacity of the elements. Usually, we identify three main types of uh, failure modes bending or rocking, um, shear failure due to diagonal tension, and shear failure due to sliding. I'm not going through the equations, of course, but this is just to represent, to show that one main variable that we need to take into account is the axial force. We know that the behavior uh, of the piers and of the spandrels is governed by their geometry, their aspect ratio, their boundary conditions, the material properties, of course, but then one variable that can change during the analysis is the axial force, which could be expressed as a portion of the um, maximum axial uh, compression strength. So, depending on the level of compression, one mechanism or the other could govern and give us our uh, shear strength as the minimum of the three uh, criteria. But I was saying the axial load ratio, or in general the axial load, may vary especially on piers, during um, lateral excitation. This is because we have a frame, and uh, as you know, in frames, the axial force, frames subjected to lateral forces, the axial load on the piers, especially close to the edges of the frame, tend to vary, increase or decrease, depending on the, uh, on the direction of loading. So if these represented in black are the static axial forces, and if we focus on this uh, specific pier, we see that if we push towards the right, the compression on that pier will increase. And probably its uh, shear failure would be governed, for example, by diagonal cracking. However, when loading is reversed and we push the other way towards the left, well, the opposite thing happens. 
the axial force on that same pier reduces compared to the static conditions, and in that case, failure may be controlled by, uh, for example, flexural rocking. Tramuri is able to take into account this variation during the analysis, and so to follow the actual failure mode that corresponds to the uh, instantaneous value of the axial force on the, on the element. In reality, things are a little more complicated. This, uh, this is an example, again, from the 2012 Emilia, um, Emilia earthquake. And uh, here we have quite a regular building. Uh, it's uh, pretty much symmetric. Now, if we push to the right, we see, and let's focus on the two central piers. The two, the two ones on the sides will behave always, uh, will be controlled by rocking flexure because uh, of their aspect ratio. But the two central piers, you see in one case, the mm, left one is failing uh, following a uh, rocking behavior, while the other one is cracked in shear. When loading reverse, the opposite, th the opposite thing happens. But in this case, the axial load on those two piers is not varying that much. They're close to the center of the frame. So the axial force is pretty constant. In that case, what is changing is actually the aspect ratio. Because when we push in one direction, you see on one side of the pier, we have a door. On the, other, on the other side, a window. So the restraint condition at the bases are actually different. In one case, the pier is restrained by the ground floor spandrel. In the other case, it's not. So in one case, it's a squatter than in the other case, the same pier. And unfortunately, up to now, with our uh, equivalent frame models, we are not able to fully represent this type of behavior because we have to define a priori the geometry, while here the geometry actually depends on the load. So this is a particular case, but it's something that can be found in reality. After defining the, um, uh, our, uh, our walls and our equivalent frames for the walls, we need to start thinking about the diaphragms. And again, here it's very important to understand how stiff uh, diaphragms are, so how effectively they can connect parallel walls and also transverse walls compared to the direction of analysis. Usually, in uh, Tremuri, our, um, our diaphragms are modeled as orthotropic elastic membranes, and basically here we define only three of these four uh, um, parameters, the two elastic moduli and the shear modulus. However, other modeling techniques may include the use of equivalent trusses for diaphragms. And in that case, it would be possible also to capture the nonlinear behavior of, uh, of, the, um, of the diaphragms. Uh, but this is not usually, often is not uh, the case. It depends on, on the um, type of modeling that uh, the engineer wants to uh, carry out. If diaphragms are infinitely rigid, they tend to basically redistribute forces between parallel walls. If they are infinitely flexible, like at the bottom, instead they allow two parallel walls to respond almost, actually, independently from each other. And they allow the analysis to be carried out in individually for, uh, for each wall. Usually, reality is in between. So again, we have some flexibility meaning that the diaphragm is not completely uh, rigid, is not completely uh, flexible, and it has its own uh, um, on deformability. So there will be some coupling between the response of the two walls and also some distortion of the diaphragm itself. This is important when uh, we do pushover analysis because uh, uh, it can affect significantly the, the results. This is a quite regular building, but the two parallel walls are different. You see on one side we have doors, on the other side we have windows. So the stiffness and the strength will be different. If you do a pushover analysis with rigid floors, in red and in blue you can see the response of the two walls, and in green the combined one, and you can see also the deflected shape. You see that the building basically moves all together. However, if the, two wall, if the um, diaphragms are uh, infinitely uh, flexible, then we see something strange. We see that the uh, blue wall starts unloading. And that's because of the way usually pushover analysis is defined. The force ratio, the force apl are applied to the nodes, and the force ratio is maintained constant. One wall starts losing strength 
the, the uh, red, the one represented by the red uh, line, starts losing strength. So the forces on that wall are reducing. That means that also the forces on the nodes of the other wall start reducing. But that wall was still able to uh, keep loading. So what it does, it, it follows the other wall by unloading. And this is something uh, that can happen uh, in, these types, uh, in these type of buildings when you have very flexible diaphragms. In order to model the flexibility or the stiffness of, uh, of the diaphragms, there are several formulations to convert uh, our actual floor layout into an equivalent uh, elastic membrane. And some of them are already, for example, implemented in uh, Tremuri. So you just give the geometry of the floor system, and automatically these parameters are calculated. But they're not so difficult to find. They depend only on the properties of the materials, in this case, of the steel, of the joist, and of the concrete, of the topping. And based on those, and based on simple geometrical uh, considerations, you, can fi you could find uh, by yourself, if you want, the um, equivalent parameters. When we have uh, uh, wood floors, an important um, role is played by, uh, by the nailing. We could also almost see the deformation of these floors uh, as uh, the timber planks and joists remaining rigid and all the deformation taking place in, in the connection. Actually, it's a combination of the two, the formation of the wood and of the connection. There are formulations that can be found uh, internationally in uh, building codes more refined, like the one in the New Zealand specifications that combine the properties of uh, nails and the properties of wood, or even more simplified approaches like in the US uh, codes. And in this case, you can see that just based on the uh, type of floor and on the only geometric considerations, you can get an estimate of uh, the shear stiffness to assign to the diaphragm. This may be more or less accurate depending on the case. It's a very simplified approach. But that's uh, in the um, ASC uh, provisions in the United States. Also, uh, vaults can be converted into equivalent, um, into equivalent uh, membranes. And uh, there is a work uh, by uh, Professor Cattari, Professor Lagomarsino, and uh, um, another co-worker of them that uh, provides equation to do this conversion. And it's also implemented in Tremuri. Finally, we have talked about plane frames. We have talked about diaphragms. We need to connect the frames or the walls that are in different, uh, in different uh, uh, planes intersecting each other. And we do this defining uh, 3D nodes. This is nothing but simply a node that allows more degrees of freedom. It's not uh, having degrees of freedom only in the plane of the frame, but also out of plane. Be careful, we have five degrees of freedom, not six, because we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, capture the torsional response. If you think that the, we have, for example, in a node, two perpendicular walls, knowing that the equivalent frame analysis can only capture the in-plane response of wall, we cannot have torsion which would imply out of plane deformation and resistance. Our elements are resisting only in, in their plane. So torsional stiffness and strength cannot be implemented, and for this reason, that degree of freedom is suppressed. And this is a simple representation how elements are interconnected to each other, even at different angles. It doesn't have to be, of course, perpendicular, but how walls on different planes converge and are connected to 3D nodes. There is also um, tricky part about mass. If you have a 2D node in a plane, mass can be excited out of that plane by acceleration. And that would be again a problem. As we said, we can only resist forces in the plane in our global analysis with, uh, um, with equivalent frames. So the mass associated with that node excited out of plane needs to be assigned by the closest 3D nodes they connect the mass to walls that they can resist in the um, excitation direction. And this is simply done by redistributing those masses uh, proportionally to the inverse of the distance of the 3D nodes from the node where that mass uh, should be actually uh, given. Now, this is a little example of an application of such uh, modeling. To a, um, to a building that was tested at the University of Pavia in the 90s. 
And in this case, a 3D model was carried out. The building was uh, quite regular. Here you can see that the damage pattern, the experimental damage pattern, was quite well captured by the model. You see the areas shaded in uh, uh, purple and in red represent where shear damage has occurred in the elements. And you see that it corresponds quite well to the um, laboratory observations. This is another example just to stress the importance of a correct model of uh, uh, the floor diaphragm, but also to consider that stiffening and strengthening floor diaphragms can be a solution to improve the seismic performance of buildings. This is, uh, in particular, a building in the city center of Basel in Switzerland, and uh, this has been analyzed using uh, Tremuri with this uh, equivalent frame uh, approach and four different uh, stiffnesses were basically assigned to, uh, to the floors, representing different types of retrofit. Let's go the opposite way around. Model uh, DF is the one with flexible diaphragms as it is now, basically only wood planks and beams, and going upwards, we increase the stiffness up to the point where the retrofit would be a concrete slab cast on top of the existing uh, wood floor. We can see how this affects the model analysis. In one case with the DF model, no retrofit, very flexible diaphragms, we see that deformations concentrate in the central part. Let's look at the vertical direction here. Uh, meaning that, of course, uh, the walls in the central region are more stressed and subjected to more deformation than the ones uh, on the perimeter. By increasing, progressively the stiffness, we arrive to model DR, the one with the concrete slab, where you see the whole building moves together. So it's not overstressing some walls, but it distributes uh, the forces and also then the deformations to the entire system. We can find similar thing on the pushover analysis. Here we see that we can also increase the overall strength because all walls are moving together and there is not premature failure of one wall compared to another one. Mm, this is, these are the results of the pushover analysis in terms of uh, deflected shapes, and we see the same basically as we saw from the modal analysis, so we can have the entire building moving uh, together. This is also being compared to, um, to nonlinear dynamic analysis results, and we can see that uh, both uh, the nonlinear dynamic analysis and the, uh, the nonlinear static one quite agree on the uh, displacement demand and on the deflected shapes uh, uh, obtained. So with this, I finished. I thank you very much uh, for your attention, and uh, if you have questions, uh, please ask me.